Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, preparing teachers for um, using blended learning. And I think um, a lot of that's going to overlap with any kind of online learning as well, or e-learning or hybrid learning, a lot of different um, terms that people might use in different ways. Um, but I, I want to start by um, thinking about some of the opportunities that it provides us. Um, some of the things that excite people about blended learning or online learning are the fact that you can study anytime, anywhere. Um, there's an extreme uh, amount of flexibility. There are extensive materials available um, across the internet for um, context, con actual co contextualized linguistic material, as well as other um, cultural material and opportunities for lots of practice. Um, this is something I'm particularly interested in. Uh, it can be individualized very easily. It can be very accessible. And there are essentially unlimited opportunities for learning. However, um, these opportunities require extensive development in advance of the teaching so that they'll work properly. Um, and a learning management system that is um, taken off the shelf for, that most universities use uh, is not very effective for language teaching in a blended or online um, format. And there's also a requirement for a lot of ongoing maintenance. So before we even talk about some of the other things that I think we need to consider in this regard, I want to just take a step back and think about how poorly we often do our face-to-face -face instruction. And um, I use this, this image because um, even though it's black and white and it may seem ridiculous, it is uh, pretty accurate of what most classrooms look like today. It's very teacher-centered. The students are all sitting in rows. They're all, um, you know, they're they're not really engaged in kind of collaborative and student-centered activities, at least it doesn't look like it. And we have a history in um, language education of introducing technology in a manner like this, where students are basically in that same exact context as they were in that last picture, but now there's a computer in front of them. So you'll see they're not looking at each other, they're not communicating with each other, they're simply doing that same kind of activity that they would have been doing that black and white picture, but they're doing it on a computer and it probably looks something like this, which is really unfortunate. The most boring part of a textbook, um, but now it's on a computer. So that's supposed to make it um, somehow interesting or exciting. Um, so I'm hoping that the kinds of learning activities that you would be engaging students in or designing for students would look more like this. You'll notice there is technology present, but it's not the center of attention. And it's not where everybody is focused. They're focused on working together on a collaborative activity. It looks very student-centered. I don't even see the teacher. I'm hoping the teacher is somewhere nearby in case there is a need for the teacher. But I think this is the kind of activity that we want to kind of uh, replicate in, in a blended or online format. So these are the big challenges challenges that we face, you'll, you'll notice that um, the first one is the same as the first opportunity that I shared. Um, you can learn anytime and anywhere. And this often means that instructors need to be available every time and everywhere. And I know some people who have, um, who have assumed that responsibility and will give students in an online format their, their personal phone number and they might be teaching in 12 different time zones and they'll answer the phone at two in the morning. I don't think that's a very sustainable model. So I think there are things that we need to do in order to just make our actions sustainable and um, reasonable. So I think we set expectations um, for both the learners and the instructors in these um, settings. We, we need to um, account for learner motivation. Um, the attrition rate in classes that are hybrid or online is still very high. Um, we need to account for learner schedules, particularly if there are multiple time zones, um, or if one of the reasons that you're doing this in the first place is, that, is learner's availability. Um, and there is this potential for the lack of connection or a lack of teacher presence, but there are things that we can do about that. There's, there's an assumed lack of support, as if everything happens um, in, on, online in one time, but there can be facilitators, there can be other people that, that help. Um, of course, you need a reliable internet connection. Um, technical challenges may be faced as well. Um, but one of the big things that I think about is 
that people transfer their expectations and their practices from face-to-face -face teaching. And teaching online is extremely different and it requires different skills and different ways of thinking about things. And I'm gonna share some of these ideas um, in, this, in this talk briefly. There's this assumption that um, students today are all digital natives and they have uh, tech savviness and they're going to be able to overcome all of these challenges, but that has largely been debunked. So um, I think you need to consider that. And there may be other cultural issues depending on where you're, where you're doing this. I think we need to raise awareness among teachers who are entering this world to not focus on technology. Um, to think about how those skills are different from face to face, to think about things related to instructional design. And again, I will talk about this in a few minutes. Um, there should be appropriate teacher preparation and we should allow for flexibility. When we come to instructional design, one of the things that I think is most important is to consider multimedia principles. And these are principles that, that simply look at the use of multimedia, which is text and basically anything else being presented to learners and how those should be presented um, in order to make them most cogent, right? In order to make it salient. So um, these are some principles that, that you can go through on your own at your leisure when you have time. There are some other um, resources that can be very helpful. This is the TESOL Technology Standards. It's a book that I um, helped author a few years ago that provides um, benchmark expectations for technology use across language education. And one of the areas um, has to do with distance or blended or online learning. But I really want to spend most of this time focusing on some current and future trends that I see in this area. Um, and they're very, very exciting opportunities, a lot of really interesting things that are happening and um, that are going to continue to um, happen and provide even more opportunities. So we have extensive authentic materials across the internet. Uh, we have things that are social media driven so that they engage people to um, be involved and collaborate in the same kind of way that people do in their personal social media lives. We have flipped learning, we have data driven learning, we have data visualization, which can be both good for learners as well as for us in tracking our learners performance. Um, we have gaming and gamification and other related things. We have adaptive learning. We have augmented and VR, uh, virtual reality experiences. We have artificial intelligence and the internet of things. As far as the extensive authentic material goes, there are things like TED Talks. And TED has also created these materials that are intentionally designed for people who are learning English. And so there are instructional materials that support the use of TED Talks. Um, now, of course, TED Talks have transcripts that can be um, available in up to 80 different languages. So these can be used for a number of different things, or this template could be used for teaching any number of other languages because it, um, it's, it's a very, very good model that gets into a lot of really interesting activities that aren't simply multiple choice kinds of activities. They have different levels in this and they have um, different uh, activities that you go through throughout the process prior to watching a, a talk, while you're watching and after you're watching and focused on different language um, skill areas. Uh, another great use of the extensive materials that are available is this website called Youglish, which uses all of the video on YouTube as a corpus so that you can search for a word or phrase and you get to see numerous examples of that word or phrase. So here you can see that I searched for the phrase don't know and I found 113,061 examples of the phrase don't know and I get to play through those. So I can watch this one and then I can click the button and see the next one or I can listen to a longer extended piece of this video and get more contextual information about how that's being used. So I think if you don't know how to pronounce don't know by the time you're done watching a number of these um, or you don't understand what it means or how it's being used, I, I think um, you probably have bigger problems. 
I think some of this extensive material is just great fodder for any classroom um, discussion, writing activities about the kinds of things that are happening culturally around our lives on the internet. And so I think things like this, this is just an example of millions of different things that you might use. This is what happens on the internet in a minute in the year 2019. And when 2020 gets here, you're gonna be able to find this example as well, because I've been using it for a number of years. And um, it's pretty fascinating stuff to talk about. And I think just the topic of social media itself is, is interesting to most people. Um, if, if you're not familiar with what flipping the classroom means, it's, it's a very popular topic these days. Um, it's, it's a very simple thing where the lecture is basically done online or at home or somewhere other than the classroom. And then when students come into the classroom, they're better prepared for the um, learning activities. And so they do things that they might have been more likely to do as homework in the classroom, but they're again doing it as a group activity in a collaborative space and it's, it's co-constructive. And so um, it's a great way to really make the most of the time that you have together in a class space. I want to talk about some of these other trends that are happening. We have expansive data sets and analytical abilities. So um, these might be things that we usually think of as being advantageous for researchers, but I think they also are really, really useful for us as instructors um, in, in different ways, and I'll, I'll get to that. We have data visualization, data aggregators, data mashups can help us raise awareness of our students' performance, predict their future performance, design data-driven learning, and design individual learning. So as far as presenting information to learners or for learners to be presenting information in their own presentations, using data visualization can convey so much information about any topic. Here we have injuries related to football. Um, I, I could write a paragraph or two or three about this, or I can show you this one image that captures all of this data, and it's a, a really um, meaningful and quick way to gather a lot of information. Similarly, um, ed tech companies today are supposedly capable of gathering up to 10 million data points per student per day, and that can take a lot of different forms. So there are um, ways of viewing individual student data that can be very, very informative and can help you to change what you do and better understand your students. And ultimately, I think I'm looking forward to a day in the not very distant future where this will result in us no longer needing to stop instruction in order to do assessment. So I'm showing you a a number of different screenshots of different ways of observing student data and their progress. You can see um, how you can monitor this. Um, the more that students do their work online, particularly in a learning management system, the more data that you have in order to make that more meaningful. And then you can parse that out across different activities. Um, this is one example of how the learning management system Moodle um, can offer you opportunities for this. And um, Moodle has many more of these than any other learning management system because it is open source and allows um, different people to develop different um, approaches to this. You can see how people are interacting with others as part of a network of learning. And I want to talk about gamification. If you um, do not know what this means, if you are familiar with video games at all, if you, you do things like you level up or you, um, you get badging, so you accomplish some small task and maybe you get a badge. So you get a little uh, symbol, a sticker, a, um, an image that represents that skill that you're able to do. Um, so it's kind of like having a lot of mini classes within one bigger class, um, but it, it provides ongoing motivation and incentivization for students to continue to make progress. Um, and often, especially in language learning, students often don't feel like they're making progress on a regular basis, um, particularly the higher that they get up in, in their abilities, right? So 
there are a number of things that you can do with um, gamification. And you'll even see in the professional world now um, sites like LinkedIn have um, badging like this for your um, micro credentialing to acknowledge what you've accomplished. But perhaps the most exciting development that we are going to see and um, look forward to in the future is artificial intelligence. Um, and when I think about this in education, I think about using it for assessment and grading, for tracking and monitoring students' progress, and their um, and and in most cases where they face challenges and how we may be able to better recognize those challenges and um, and help them around that or provide them with more information or more content that's going to be more appropriate for their needs at that moment. Um, things related to automation and translation, intelligent tutoring systems, virtual and augmented reality, and um, looking forward to a global classroom. So in popular culture, um, artificial intelligence takes on a, a number of different forms, um, either really um, playful and interesting or really kind of um, dystopic uh, futures where we're all going to be doomed and robots are going to take over. Um, in reality, it's a little bit different. Um, we have things like face detection. We have things like um, like uh, verification systems, and we have automation that has you know transformed industry. Um, right now, we are in a period where education is also being transformed by artificial intelligence. So you're probably all familiar with um, Google Translate. This is a, a great resource for students to use to, um, you know, point their phone at the world and you can do that and see um, texts converted to a number of different texts. Um, it, it, it's useful for very short text. It, it starts to break down when you get into longer text, but you're using your phone here. You're probably only going to see a phrase or a word or something like that. Um, this community is, is what it is now. Google Translate is no longer just an app. It is a community of people interested in language and language learning and translation that um, can meet together for a variety of uh, purposes online. So if you're interested in that, I think that that's, that's definitely a place to, to go. Um, this is an example of a game that is built into a Moodle course. And so it allows you to travel around the world and identify things and describe those, tell stories about these locations. And um, all of it happens within Moodle and links to Wikipedia information that are connected in here. But um, people do this collaboratively. It's a really interesting example. And this is what it looks like when you're um, using this app on a phone. Another similar um, augmented reality based um, app is Tailblazer. And this is a mobile game development app that lets anybody create um, games that use augmented reality. So if you go out into the real world and you have your device and you point it at something in the world that has been tagged, you get an extra layer of information on top of that. So, um, Last year, I worked with um, some local education organizations, um, schools, and um, a, a local uh, naturalist education program, and we built some tailblazer-based games that students were then able to go out into the, these real-world environments that are meaningful places and learn more about them because of that extra information on top of that. And that's just one example of how augmented reality is beginning to be used in education, and Google Translate is another one. We've got a variety of automated writing evaluation tools. People are probably familiar with things like spell checkers and Word and Google Docs, and commercial products like Criterion, MyAccess, WriteLab, Grammarly. But you may not be as familiar with all of these that are currently being used to do um, assessment, and they're all automated. So when you write for the TOEFL um, IBT, uh, you know, humans are not grading your, your writing assignment. It's being automatically um, assessed. edX as well, which, is, um, which was built to support the, the largest MOOC that um, exists. So 
all of these companies are already doing this sort of thing. And we have tools like Grammarly that allow us to, um, to get this kind of assistance while we're writing. Um, I, I am fortunate that um, one of my professors when I was in graduate school is Dana Ferris, who's a, one of the most famous um, second language writing uh, experts in the world. And I, I met her recently and I told her that I, you know, how much I love Grammarly. And she said she uses it for all of her writing. So I no longer feel um, embarrassed to tell people you should use Grammarly. Um, of course, one of the reasons that this, these kind of tools are beneficial is to do something like avoid plagiarism or, or help people learn how not to plagiarize because it can help identify plagiarism, right? Um, another automated writing tool that I'm really fond of is the Moodle essay autograde. And this is Gordon Bateson. He is the developer of this. Um, and so if anybody is using Moodle, you can put this inside of your Moodle course or um, site. And it allows you to customize the automation. So you can set it for students to need to write certain words or certain sentences or a certain length or use um, any number of things that you want them to do. And you get to set that yourself as a teacher. This is the kind of technology that I'm very fond of for um, these kinds of environments because the decision is not being made by a textbook publisher or by a, de a developer, it's being made by the teacher. There are other things that we can do with this kind of writing as well. Um, you might be surprised to know that you can build your own chatbot for your students to practice texting with others. Um, and you can do this without any programming skills. Um, I, that, I think that's a very positive and thing that can be very interesting for students. Um, you can focus on building grammatical accuracy. You can focus on particular kinds of interaction. Um, the dark side of this is that the majority of internet traffic in the world right now is from these artificial intelligence units. And usually when you interact with them, you think they're a real person. Um, we're going to see a lot more happening with this in education because Google has ramped up all of what all of their interests around this. So I think um, there's going to be a lot of other stuff like that. There are some similar um, products like this uh, being developed at, at Queen's University. This is just last year. They have a, um, an advisor, uh, an academic advisor that is a video chat hologram. So not only are you um, interacting like this, but you are actually seeing the physical manifestation of that individual. However, there are some challenges that I want to share. A AI does not teach social skills or human communications. It can't replace human teachers, but I think that's a good thing. It requires constant internet connectivity. Um, it's initially expensive, but of course, like everything, prices are decreasing as we use more. Um, there may be a lack of willingness to embrace AI for, uh, on behalf of administrators, um, instructors, learners, um, people are kind of a little um, apprehensive in some ways. Um, and of course, this requires ongoing teacher preparation. But um, there are a number of opportunities that AI can have in education beyond what I've already shown you. Um, we have AI tutors that are individually customized for students, can change how schools find, teach, and support students. So engaging in a lot of things that we currently devote a lot of manpower to. Um, it can be involved in ongoing assessment, individualized instruction. It can automate basic functions, help identify opportunities for course improvement by identifying weaknesses in a course, can change how we find and interact with information, but it will definitely change the roles of teachers, lessen the stress of trial and error practice, and um, automate some administrative tasks as well. The last thing that I really want to talk about is individualized or personalized learning. So this should be data-driven um, with a lot of adaptive content so that each individual goes through a path, an educational pathway slightly differently. But they all end up at basically the same place. It's paced differently for different students based on their abilities and their needs. And there's continuous assessment and it's customizing future learning. And then we'll, that's all building into learner modeling that has helped to 
helping to um, inform that. So this is just a, a, um, an infographic. Since I'm going to promote the use of infographics, I think it's a really um, good way of visualizing this. And this is kind of talking about that individualized, personalized learning. One way of um, learning a little bit more about blended learning in language education might be to um, look at this book that I wrote last year. I edited it. I wrote the um, introduction and the conclusion. And there are 11 other chapters of people sharing their experience of teaching in an online or hybrid um, class that is a TESOL-based class, whether it's teacher preparation or English language education. And the very last thing that I have to say is whatever you're doing around this topic or just about any other topic, um, the most important thing to do is really to build a community that around you that you work with, a community of practice. And so these are my graduate students. And um, they are essentially my community who I learn from every day and I share things with every day. And um, together, we are always um, much better informed than any one of us would be individually. Thank you.